When he healed people, Jesus would sometimes say, your faith has made you whole. As things have panned out over the centuries, this saying has frequently been misapplied as it's your fault you are ill and not getting better. Sometimes that's true, of course. The remedy for illness and misfortune may lie in the hands of the person experiencing it. But that didn't stop Jesus intervening generously and effectively with the shalom he carried inside and practised. And it shouldn't stop us either. I wanted to draw apart the threads of the tangle of thought that gathers around this topic because it causes a problem. There's Jesus's command to be perfect as our Father in Heaven is perfect. Now, as its context makes apparent, that simply means love should be unconditional, not a reward for loyalty and good behaviour. But we often feel seized with a sense of our own inadequacy when we read it, even if we have understood what it means. And then there's the question of what it might mean to be made whole. How would you know if you were? Your prayers would be effective, you would be overflowing with peace and joy, your touch and presence would heal others. Yes, probably. But the contemplation of that thought is also enough to pitch us into a feeling of failure and uselessness. It seems that, taken all round, the primary effect of religion is to fill us with guilt and shame and keep it topped up. Which is always handy for controlling people, isn't it? I find it always helps to look at Jesus about prayers being effective, him overflowing with peace and joy, and his touch and presence healing others. In Gethsemane, he begged that this cup of suffering would pass him by. It didn't. About overflowing with peace and joy, again in Gethsemane, he crouched and wept and sweated blood overwhelmed with terror at what was to come. And his touch and presence also brought some fairly caustic remarks to the religious leaders. He was not unendingly tolerant towards his family when they tried to manipulate him. And he did turn over the tables of the money changers in the Gentile court of the temple. Perfect and whole are not, I hope you know, synonymous with emollient behaviour that never rocks the boat. Truth doesn't promote harmony in every social situation. With that said, Let's consider the practicalities in terms of lived experience of faith that makes us whole. I can identify three aspects for us to think about today. The first is belief. Nobody is ever perfect, yet Jesus says, be perfect as your father is perfect. As the letter to the Hebrews puts it, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Or as Paul puts it, writing to the Corinthian church, now we see puzzling reflections in a mirror, then we shall see face to face. So part of our wholeness, God's shalom, 
is appropriating through trust what is not yet manifest. Inherent in your faith has made you whole is the implication that it hasn't arrived yet, but you have made sure it will. Booked your ticket, as it were. Belief is what you might also call insight. As the Gospel of John has it in the resurrection narratives, how blessed are those who have not seen and yet believe. The Gospel writers, Mark and John especially, draw a strong comparison between faith and sight. John characterises it as seeing the light, while Mark shows us a picture of discipleship as the healing, gradual or instant, of spiritual blindness. In our faith, we are a work in progress. We see the possibility, we glimpse where we're headed, and that vision of what is not yet made manifest creates the conviction we need to work towards bringing it into reality. As the book of Proverbs says, where there is no vision, the people perish. That's exactly right. That's what the flame of faith is all about. The vision of a truth and reality not yet manifest, but inherent and integral to life and healing. You can see this rolling out, the people perishing where there is no vision, in those church communities that allow themselves to become all about fundraising and property and admin and procedure and ritual. Stuff that keeps you busy with the externals so you don't have to think about anything else. The body of religion without the soul. A zombie apocalypse of creedal community. Without something to believe in, the faith that makes you whole cannot exist. And unless you have a vision, you have nothing to believe in. God is not invisible, but without the vision that gives you insight into what is not yet manifest, you cannot see the realm of God. Then the second aspect of faith that makes us whole is relationship. The faith that makes us whole depends on an authentic personal relationship with Jesus triggered by his invitation. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, he says. If anyone hears me and opens the door, I'll come in and eat with them and they with me. And we are what we eat. It is a metaphor for becoming substantially the same as him, functionally one. Resist the expressions of faith that want to focus on membership of the institution while steadfastly ignoring and refusing to express in words the central and foundational core relationship with Jesus. Without it, there's nothing worth having in Christianity. However, tagging along with the faith community is how uncertainty moves forward. We learn by emulation. Going to church may be for a long time the nearest a person can get to drawing near to Jesus, to straining to hear his voice and his knock, at the moment distinctly outside us. The body of Christ is there in the breaking of the bread, the sharing, the circle of fellowship, the household of faith. It holds the catching power of faith and courage, of hope and love, that will heal us once we pick it up for ourselves. So relationship 
with Jesus and with the people of the household of faith are part of how we exercise the faith that makes us whole. And then thirdly, there is practice. We are practitioners. Faith is something we do, something we live, not only a hypothesis or a story that we tell ourselves and think about. We are learners and the story, the vision and the relationship underpin how we learn. We are students, disciples and an aspect of faith is a rhythm of discipline. Discipline is how we live, our practice, and that's holistic, not narrow. The discipline of faith is our politics and how we shop and how we dress and present ourselves, the food we eat and the transport and housing we choose, how we treat others, not forgetting the people we actually live with. It is steady and progressive. It is undertaken in community and it works to manifest the unseen. Praxis is the means by which faith becomes manifest. What James said in his epistle, in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Praxis incarnates and engenders faith, like Jesus doing his healing. But Christ, who makes us whole, is himself the wounded healer, broken. So the practice of faith has a rhythm of dismembering and remembering, confession and forgiveness. The reach and realm of Christ has arrived, but is not yet completely manifest. We know the story and we have caught the vision and we have embraced the community and invited in the Lord. But the praxis of faith is present continuous. We have to go on putting into the world day by day, never, living, never giving up, never losing hope, refusing to be discouraged. And this is our witness. Belief, relationship, practice. This is how we live the faith that makes us whole. It's a work in progress.